you know, it's really quite interesting to me. You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, it, this whole COVID thing, you know, every day I learn something new. And I don't mean new about the disease or new about, you know, any of that. I, just little things I learn, you know. I mean, it, it's, if, if you really look at life and you are a seeker, you'll always see little things. Like, I don't know about you, everybody here has got a mask on. I mean, you know, COVID-19 makes you wear a mask, right? I mean, the one thing I've discovered is that when you put your mask on in the morning, sometimes you say, oh, that reminds me, I can tell what I had for dinner last night. I can smell it. <laughs> it makes me almost think, thank God, that there's other pieces of clothing that doesn't do the same thing to me with smell. It really is about finding out the truth, isn't it? It's about honesty. It's about putting together the things together in life and coming up with what's true and seeking that truth in all things. You know, it, it's interesting. The gospel that we have says, it starts off, as I just read it to you, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's funny. Had I gone on Jeopardy and been asked what was the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, I, I, I don't know, I might have started off with the nativity. Well, I mean, wouldn't you? I would have started, well, Christmas is the beginning. It's the beginning of the year, and yet this says the beginning was not the birth of Jesus. The beginning, actually, the first thing he quotes is the prophet Isaiah. Almost like the beginning was a thought of God, a thought of God, that sort of preceded it all. In other words, God the Creator, maybe even before He made all of humankind, had in His mind, in His heart, that somehow the beginning of this whole thing is, I'm going to redeem my people and bring them back. This is what's going to happen. I'm not giving you all the details. I always hate Christianity. I'll tell you what, I really hate Christianity. You know why? Because I'm so sick of God keeping me on a need-to-know basis. But truly, truly, that's what Christianity is. It's a mystery that unfolds in your life. That's what this faith is. It's unfolding. I mean, I don't know about you, but my life is unfolded in front of my faith. Sometimes it's, you know, five steps forward, but a lot of times it's three steps back. And here it tells us very clearly the beginning of, of the good news of Jesus Christ started before the birth of Christ. It started somewhere back where finally the prophet Isaiah said what he had to say. Jesus isn't even on the scene yet. He hasn't been baptized yet. And it starts telling about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is his cousin. There are about six months difference in age. John's about six months older. It said that when John was still in his mother's womb and Jesus was in Mary's womb, that the two mothers of both John the Baptist and Jesus got together and that Elizabeth, John's mother, just being around Jesus in Mary's womb said that her baby John recognized that he was that close, that she leaped for joy. That there was something that said life was about to begin. Now, do you think he had all the details at that point? I, I don't know. I doubt it. But somehow there was a knowledge of it. You see, the race doesn't begin at the starting line. The race in anything always begins when you finally make up your mind, I'm going to run that race, and you begin to prepare for the race. That's what these scriptures are about more than anything else today. It's the preparation for being and receiving the good news of Jesus Christ. That it starts before everything. It starts with you saying, you know, something in my life is missing. i got to fill it. That I wasn't created just to be independent of myself. I've been created to be in relationship with God. You know, most people don't like that because, you know, the, the beginning of it all is always confession. Not me, I'll be up front with you. 
relationship usually begins with confession. Confession of who you are, of what you did good, what you didn't do so good. Most people think confession is just where you sort of air all the things you did wrong. But confession is truly where you say, here I am, this is me. And it says very clearly that, uh, you know, that's what John says, you know, confess your sins, come to me. It's funny because most of us don't want to get honest like that. And I think that's the stumbling block in most of us as human beings. Most of us don't really get honest. We write our own narrative within ourselves, and we think, this is what my image is, which, by the way, it's really not. Your image is the image of God that was put inside you. But then we write, this is the narrative that I want to portray to the rest of the world, which it really probably isn't totally accurate, if even at the best of things. But it takes honesty to begin to say, here I am just as I am. And that's where everything starts. I've got to ask you a question. How honest are you? I mean, when you really look at yourself. You know, it's funny because as I looked at these scriptures, I thought to myself, how honest am I? And most of the time when I get scared about being honest, it's because, well, I don't want to share all the details of my life with everybody. Do you know that when John the Baptist, who let's just say this, he wasn't called John the Baptist because he was an Episcopalian. He really was much more of a Baptist, let's just say. Very rigid, very set in his ways. And, you know, whenever someone came out to get baptized by John, he didn't look at him and say, okay, I, I want you to give me all the details of your sin. There's no record recording of that. The closest thing you get with John the Baptist of ever where he's negative with people who come out to him is what it says in the Gospel of Matthew where it says that the Pharisees and the Sadducees come out by where he is being, where, by where he is baptizing. It doesn't say they came out to get baptized. It says they came out this thing's a pain in the butt. <laughs> it says that they came out to observe what was going on, but not to participate in what was going on. That's the only time John the Baptist is really not very nice to people. He calls them a brood of vipers, which if you want to know what that translates in everyday street language, I'll tell you later. But, uh, but basically, he, he jumps on. But to the people who are the sinners and the tax collectors, as they refer to them, which, by the way, I'm one of those, but I'm not a tax collector. Um, he's always, come, come, let me do this. And he gets them to start on a new path. He doesn't say that everything that you ever did is just going to go away. There's still consequences to bad actions. But what he says is you're not going to go along into those bad actions ever again. Because you're starting a new life, you're going to be along a new path. That you're following into a new path. You know, a lot of us don't want to be on the path of God. A lot of us just want to be on our own path. You know, I always love to tell a story. This is probably about 24 years ago. Ian's 35 now. He was 11 at that point. And um, Sally and I, actually, Sally will be up there this week. She's out of town. And, um, we have a place in Sky Valley, Georgia, and if you've ever been in North Georgia, then the mountains, and there's a mountain up there, it's called Raven Ball Mountain, and, uh, and you know, that's one of the hikes that we used to do all the time, and Ian, when he was 11 years old, you know, we were on the hike, Sally, Ian, and myself, we were going up to Raven, to the observation tower up on the top. We got up to the top, sat on the observation tower, but of course, he's 11 years old, and his you know, stepdad and his mom were moving too slow on the way down. He wanted to get down there faster. And as you know, if you know that trail at all, or any trail usually, they have switchbacks, you know, goes back and forth. Well, he, you know, got the idea, well, you know, if I just bypass the switchback, because that's extra mileage, if I go straight down the hill, I'll be there quicker. Well, you know, I mean, I, I've always been one to, you know, say that the only way I really learn is by making mistakes. So when he said he was going to do it, I said, go for it. 
And he cut off and he started walking down through, you know, the switchback. So he's in the middle of a pretty thick forest and he's going through it. And all of a sudden, when he gets, I don't know how far, pretty far from the trail, I hear him yelling, Jim, Jim, I don't know where I am. I can't find the other's trail. And I, I was like, I started laughing if you want the truth. I said, well, turn around and come back the way you went in. And he turned around and he came back the way he went in. And he was back on the path. You see, I think that's what John the Baptist would say to me if he was around today. You've been on the path, but you don't always stay on the path. Anybody always stay on the path here? So turn around, which by the way, is confession, and come back the way you went in, and then get on the path again. Who did John the Baptist get irritated at? It wasn't the folks who were coming out who were seeking. It was irritated at the folks that were coming out just to observe. What kind of faith you got? Are you an observer? Are you a participant? Are you one that doesn't mind sort of sometimes making mistakes, which by the way, I enjoy making some mistakes. But I enjoy more asking for forgiveness and confessing that I made those, not necessarily sharing the details with anybody. I don't want you all to know every detail of my life. But I do want you to know the concept of my life. I want you to know that I mess up. But I'll tell you what, God's love is far greater than any mess up I have. And if I pay the price for messing up, so be it. But nothing's going to sway me from the love of God. And that's the good news. That's what the good news is. It's so exciting to be in love and know you're loved by God. You know, something that happened the last night. Sally left on Thursday to, to actually, she's up in Wrightsville Beach right now and she'll go on to Sky Valley, but um, it was funny. She has her one dog who is King, who actually, King's the dog that pulled me to the ground when I broke my leg. Um, there was another dog at the time too, I, but King was the one who actually got me to the ground. And uh, he's about 70 pounds, a hound, he's nuts. I mean, we got him out of the pound. I love that dog. But Sally always says, that's my dog, because she's the one that rescued him, okay? And it was funny because the last three nights that I went to bed, you know, I went in and I said, King, come on in, jump up on the bed, you can sleep, you know, because he's a little bit rattled because things are different. You know that every night that I'm home for these last three nights, he sits by the door looking. In the middle of the night, he'll get up three or four times and he'll go out to the door and look because Sally's not there. God, I wish I loved God that much. You know, I really do. I wish I looked for him in everything. But I don't know about you, I get distracted real easy. Even when he's eating, which by the way, that dog likes to eat. Even when he's eating, He'll stop every once in a while, go over and look out the door. It's almost like there's a part of me missing. Part of you is God. Part of you is God. I pray that you participate in trying to walk with him on the path. You know, I want to end with actually part of the speech that uh, Teddy Roosevelt wrote. Uh, it was written, uh, spoken on uh, April 23rd, 1910 in Paris, France, and it's called The Man in the Arena. It goes, the part that applies goes like this. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. 
whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I leave you this day, the second Sunday of Advent. Are you in the process of participating? Or is your faith much more just one that you observe? If you're just observing, I'm sad for you. But if you're a participant, even if it hurts, I'm glad you're in there. And I pray that you help me as I help you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.